Welcome back to another awesome video. Today we're listening to the Yamaha K960. If I had to pick the best decade in which to buy a cassette deck, the early 1980s would be it. And the Yamaha K960 represents that era well, with an almost perfect balance of solid construction, sound quality features, and good styling. Let's take a listen. Before we get into the features, let's talk about the design of the K960. The slim, soft touch controls set beside the tape compartment give it a very clean look. A door hides all the extra controls you wouldn't need to use once a tape is loaded and calibrated. The counter digits are black on white and the front panel jacks are gray. The text and labeling are not too large. Overall this cassette deck is going to look great sitting on a shelf. The front panel sliders have a very smooth feel to them. Having an output level is nice for your headphones. Even these tiny knobs down here behind the door feel very solid. Every control has good feedback, whether it be a click or an indicator light. And the speed of the electronic controls on this 1981 cassette deck rival many later decks, including this 1990s JVC. If you press play on both these things at the same time, the Yamaha clearly engages faster. Although this deck is a few years newer, it matches the design of my Yamaha CR640 from 1979 very well. Note these knobs with their single red dot, for example. And this brings up an interesting point. In the catalogs I found online, they list the K960 at the top of the line, but none of the other models below it have this style. However, if you go back a few years earlier, you'll see this is an older design that they brought forward and added DBX. One of the main features on this tape deck that's noticeable is the wired remote control. And you can control the different modes, play, stop, rewind. What do you and think? There's about me touching all the controls. So yeah. there's something interesting um, about this. It kind of hides the door. You mean the door hides some of the controls? What do you think you like the look yeah. of this tape deck? Yeah, I like the look. Yeah. And what, what has Bart said? Ew, the remote has a cord on it. Yes. Gross. The remote has a cord on it. My first remote. Coincidentally, the same time I got fat. One of the most unique things about this deck is the fact that it incorporates two different noise reduction systems. Now, noise reduction is all about removing that hiss from the background of your recordings. Have you heard the hiss? Yes, if you turn off that special mode. Although Dolby eventually won in the marketplace, DBX might actually be superior technically because it gives you more dynamic range. So why did Dolby win? The answer seems to be backwards compatibility. Noise reduction is a manual setting. So if you accidentally play back a Dolby encoded tape without turning on Dolby B, it sounds reasonably okay. However, playing back a DBX encoded tape without turning DBX on does not sound good at all. Note that the DBX affects not only the treble, but the lower frequencies as well. Dolby, of course, became the standard, and as you can see in these commercial tapes, it advises you to simply adjust the treble uh, if your cassette deck doesn't have Dolby, uh, like in the car or an older deck or Walkman or something. So DBX probably sounds better, but uh, is less compatible. So in the next section, we're going to take a look inside and what I did to get this thing working. If you're not interested, just skip ahead three or four minutes. When I got this from eBay, nothing was working. And, but you could hear a motor humming, so high likelihood that, uh, you know, as with 99% of all cassette decks, it was just belts. Popping off the top, everything inside looks very neat and well organized. Four fuses, all the wires are tied together, most have connectors. This unit is designed so that it can be worked on. 
The first thing you notice is this large DBX board to the right. You can really tell this is an optional add-on. The only connections to the rest of the circuitry are the wires on the right, and it's sort of placed on top of everything. This entire board is dedicated to the DBX system, and if you look closely, you can see there are parallel circuits labeled for left and right channels, and some of those potentiometers have uh, frequencies on them, so I guess that helps adjust the, the way the DBX circuit works. I don't need to adjust any of that stuff, because if you look down at the left, you can see belts are indeed the problem. Looks like the uh, capstan belt has melted away and wrapped itself around the motor. The counter belt is also gone, and this belt, while not important for sound quality, is important because that little sensor there to the left of it determines if the tape is move, moving, and if it's not moving, it will stop it. So we got to replace at least two belts to get this thing going. While there is a lot of plastic on the inside, there is a lot of metal too. It's a really solid case. Now these uh, sliders right here, there's two of them for output level and record level, and there's actually a sort of a dedicated little metal slider here. That's why you get that smooth feel. It's a really nice touch. So the potentiometers are loose, but those things provide this real smooth slider motion. Here I am removing the remains of the counter belt. Based on the dust and everything, I think this deck probably just sat in somebody's attic or whatever, and they turned it on and the belts had gone to goo and went too hard to clean up. Now, when I got the mechanism out, these uh, wires right here, the head wires, were the only thing that I couldn't disconnect, but I just put a piece of cardboard there where I could work on it. Just removing two screws allowed me to access the capstan belt, and as you can see, I just had to clean that off. Now look at that flywheel. That is a massive flywheel. You can see the little holes there, I guess, where they drilled it to balance it. You just don't see that kind of quality. By the end of the cassette era, these things were cheap, but that is really going to be nice. I just had a belt in the parts drawer. This is not the belt. I think the one I ended up using was a flat belt. It was about nine centimeters, I believe. The counter belt was easy to replace. I just got one of those from an assortment. But if you look closely, you'll see there's another problem right there. The idler tire is broken in half. Yeah. So that's not good. That is going to be difficult to replace. Couldn't find an easy source for those online. So what I did was I just used a number 12 plumbing O-ring from this set. And uh, that seems to match. I, I roughed it up a little bit with sandpaper, put it in there, and uh, it seems to work just fine. You can see it's got a decent gripping force. Also, interestingly, you see those little brake pads coming in and out. I really like the design of this thing. Uh, it seems to work pretty well. Here it is with the tape in, just to show that it works before I put it back together. During the... Uh, this assembly process, this light bulb burned out. It goes in this panel behind the cassette and shines through. Now it was originally clear. I replaced it with a green LED and a resistor. So it sort of matches the look and feel of my receiver and the VU meter. So as we wrap this video up, I would note that there are some features missing such as auto reverse or music search. But in general, my conclusion is this is a very high quality piece of audio equipment designed to deliver good sound. It's really, really well done. I, I really like it. Anyway, that's about wraps it up. What do you think? I think this tape deck's cool. And I'll see you next time for another awesome video. In our next video, we will talk about either a TV or a military tape deck. Bye. Bye for now.